So, Berto, I have two emails here that I thought were perfect for you to respond to. I'm really curious what you have to say about these emails and the questions that they pose. One email is about childhood sexual exploitation from a friend. Mm -hmm. And the other is an email about infidelity. So let's get to it. What do you say? Let's do it. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. My name is Umberto Castaneda, and I'm a lucky pedal puller. So this first email is from anonymous listener. She says, and by the way, trigger warning, this is about childhood sexual abuse. Uh, she says, where is the line between healthy childhood sexual exploitation and peer sexual abuse? What's the line? Here's some background. I had a, I had a sorry, hard... Sorry, did he say exploitation or exploration? Explore, sorry, what did I say? Exploitation. Uh, right, exploration. Exploration, okay. Did I say that the first time? Yeah. <laughs> and the, but the second time I said exploitation. I think what we, we're trying <laughs> to get to healthy exploration compared to abuse. Peer, you know, yeah, from a friend, yeah, yeah. yeah, when you're a child. Here's the background, she says. I had a hard time making friends as a child. And one of my first friends used to repeatedly take me up into the loft at her house. Hmm. We were both six years old. She would tell me to take off my clothes, then kiss me, and then make me perform sexual acts on her. I was always very ashamed of it, and I never told anyone. She told me not to tell anybody, and I needed a friend, so I tried to forget about it. I have since grown up with an avoidant attachment style. I am also hypersexual towards men. Yep. I have anxiety, eating disorders. I have bad boundaries with people, and I have identity problems. And I have trouble becoming close with women. More than one therapist over the years has encouraged me to explore my past for sexual abuse. But the, at the time, I wasn't particularly conscious of the memory. So just chiming in, I think what anonymous listeners are saying that more than one therapist said, I think there's a chance you've been sexually abused as a child. You have some of the signs. I think it's worth exploring. And anonymous listener probably said, oh, I don't think so. Because she's saying at the mm. time, I wasn't particularly conscious of the memory. And then recently became aware of these memories and is now wondering, was that abuse or was that exploration going on with the email? My question is, was I sexually abused? At 38 years old, I'm still not sure about it. Thanks for any, any insight you have. And again, where is the line between healthy childhood sexual exploration and peer sexual abuse? Berto, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, obviously, one never knows. One never knows how much of this is accurate memories versus not and whatnot. But just, I'm just guessing based on what I'm hearing here, that sadly, that other six-year-old, in my mind, was likely being abused. What are the hallmarks? Um, the the uh, you know the the behavior of extracting the person from their normal environment to kind of a secluded private environment, and then specifically, and at six years old, specifically going for that sexual interaction. It's not like, ooh, I'll show you mine. And like, ooh, I lowered my pants. No, it's like this very specific knowledge. Yeah. I mean, just to go over her wording here. Yeah. That she would make her perform sexual acts with her. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. At six, I, that's, I'll give, that's I'll not give a typical. No. I'll give a couple examples of my experience, uh, it, you know, at five and six. Uh, at five, I was being uh, abused by by a babysitter who was 12, um, and I was being exposed to information that I normally wouldn't have had, things, acts, words, things like that. So one thing that happened one time is I was writing a love note to a little girl in my class, in my first or second grade class, and uh, my dad found the note. And in the note, I said something like, I want to make love to you. And my dad was very curious about this. He's like, do you know what that means? And he, I remember having this conversation with him. And now I am frankly 
quite surprised that that's where that ended, that that's all as far as that went, because he is a child psychiatrist or was. But anyways, the point is, in my mind, I wrote that. The only reason I wrote that is because I had heard those words from that abuser, right? And my dad was rightfully puzzled. Why is my little five-year-old boy talking about making love? And then later, when I was about six or maybe seven, uh, I remember there was this little girl that was a year and a half older than me, and we were sitting in a car ride together, and it was kind of nighttime. And I liked her, and my way to express my interest or affection for her was that I put my hand down the back of her pants while we were in the car ride. And she looked over at me, and she's like, she kind of whispered, said, like, what are you doing? She was so confused. The look on her face was completely confused. It wasn't, like, she didn't even understand what what the, con- like, no- nothing of it made sense. And then I was so confused. I obviously removed my hand. I was like, oh, I, I don't know. And so that's another example of, like, me having learned this weird behavior from my abuse and then, without even thinking about it, trying to reenact it with someone, it, those things, when I'm hearing well, this well, description... Well, to, to be micro, I think you had an association with closeness, yeah. with affection or intimacy right. at that age level, and you had had that modeled to you in a, over many events with right. this babysitter, and it was framed that way, and it probably felt that way to you, and so when you liked this girl you just had this this impulse that's right. and that's the way people tend to act particularly kids they they don't think things through and it just felt like well uh, uh, you know you put hands on that's what you do and and then you do it and uh, she looks at you with this you know horrified look and, and and then you pull your hand out and you're thinking yeah what what is that what what am I doing you know there's not a lot yeah. of self-awareness that's right. happening and it's this, uh, um, impulse that you learned through association. Right. It wasn't explicit. It's not like she said, when you like no. a girl, no, da, no, da, no. Da. but it, it was, rep- head, you know, we're, we're mimicking animals. We copy what we see. That's right. And look, and part of the reason my, my little friend who was there sitting in the car ride was so puzzled is because statistically speaking, even though little boys and girls do weird things randomly, it's odd when something like that happens. It doesn't actually normally happen. What wouldn't be maybe quite as odd is me, you know, shoving sand in a little girl's face because I don't know how to express my interest in it. Or, you know, like pinching, someone pinches or whatever. Well, okay. you know, well, you're like, going in a direction. And another direction is to want to kiss her hand. Yeah, or like I kissed her cheek. She said, what are you doing? Yeah. But there's there's levels. And so what I'm, what I'm hearing from the behavior that this little six-year-old was doing on this six-year-old that does sound outside the boundaries of the random six-year-old behavior that, that, you know, and therefore I'm, I'm guessing sadly that that person had been abused and was reenacting what they were going through. And then this little six-year-old was abused in that scenario. It, you don't have to, to be abused as a little child. It doesn't have to, there's no like age specific age, you know, yeah. now you could feel differently about the abuser, right? Like, certainly I'm not going to be like that six year old needs to be put in sensing prison for the rest of her life. But it doesn't mean that the victim wasn't being victimized. Yeah. Yeah. You can be sexually abused by someone younger than you. Yeah. It's not a thing of age. It's a thing of exploitation. It's a thing of... Like in the example I just gave, me putting my hand down the back of those pants was on, on the direction of sexual abuse. <laughs> yeah, and it, there's a difference between being abusive and having the target experience abuse or harm. Right. Someone can be, like with that hand down the pants, we would potentially characterize that as sexually abusive-like behavior, right? right. But... If her, herself, she didn't experience any sort of harm, and how do we define that? It's hard to say. You know, it's possible that she didn't because she immediately stood up for herself and said, what are you doing? And you retracted your hand. And if she encoded the experience as this weird thing that weird Birdo did, and I stood up for myself, and he didn't, and... Um, he's a good person, and he he's not out to get me, and I'm, uh, but, yeah. I'm safe as a as a human being on this planet. And if that didn't work, I know I could have told the teacher or my parents. You know, there are certain uh, protective factors in 
in place right. in people's lives potentially that can make them resilient and not experience the harm or the damage, even though they had an event happen to them that we would frame as abusive, right. it wasn't harmful to them. And so they themselves probably wouldn't say I was abused. I, I always tell this one example of how I was walking into a gas station, you know, 7-Eleven kind of thing. And this random guy on the street, we were going through the doors at the same time and he squared up and punched me Oh my so God. <laughs> hard in the shoulder. And it it was, I mean, you know, as a guy, I, we would play those games where, you know, you try to sure. hit each other in the arm. I've never been hit this hard in the shoulder. Oh. He, he had a very tight punch punch and he had a lot of leverage and he really went for it. And you it, didn't know this person. I didn't know him. You didn't and, slight them in any way. <laughs> no, we were just walking up to each other and I looked at him and just instantly trying to figure out what to do. And I was thinking, is he missing? Is he mistaking me for someone? Yeah. But also like, he just didn't look like he wanted in general to harm me, <laughs> that he just had this weird impulse or something. And he just walked away. And then I walked into the store. Like maybe he was me not mentally right. all the way there. And he was abusive, yeah. but I didn't feel abused right. in the least, right. <laughs> even though it was painful yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> as I'll get out. And I probably had a massive bruise for a while. Uh, I was not abused. I right. was, I was hit. Huh. I, I had yeah. a mark, yeah, but yeah. I wasn't abused because I didn't right. experience it. Like, like the example we've mentioned before about the Vancouver face lick. Right. You know, where uh, we were we were out and about in Vancouver late at night and we're sitting at like a shawarma store and then this pizza, pizza place, pizza place. And then this gal and I are just talking and and we're kind of dancing. There's that word gal. Silly. Gal, yeah. And then out of nowhere, she licks my face like full on bottom to top lick on the side of my face. And yeah, you know, certainly that could be abusive. That could be, but in my case, I was just like, yep, party on Garth, party on with, you know, I didn't feel abused. I didn't right. feel now, victimized. If someone did feel abused. It's perfectly reasonable. In those two yeah. scenarios, uh, that that's what happened. Yeah. It's not a choice that people make. Right. It's just a random, well, not random, but it might feel random, yeah. but it's probably a set of experiences or situations or you know context like for me in that scenario i suppose unconsciously i thought well if he decides to swing at me again i think i can actually take him <laughs> or right. i'll put up a good fight at the very least also probably someone will call the cops he doesn't know where i live yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it <laughs> didn't, no one else is ever going to do this I, the rest of my life you know and you don't even think of all these things literally you just kind of no. like do a quick math in your head yeah. Uh, yeah whereas if someone else was in that situation if they were smaller or if these things had happened to them a lot right uh, like if i had experienced other exploitative experiences that weren't even necessarily violent like just situations that day, two other experiences that were along the lines of someone being nefarious with me and trying to get me, like I had a coworker who lied about me or something. Uh, this could push me over the edge and could really uh, rattle me and cause me to uh, start to question, is the world safe for me? Yep. Do I have power? Uh, can I trust other people? Am I worthless? Should I have stood up for myself? You know, those kinds of questions are the questions that will cause downstream effects that, that can be really damaging. But Berta, I want to ask you, because for anonymous listener, what she's saying is that um, for a long time, she never uh, even remembered this. Yeah. And uh, uh, for you... When did you remember? Those oh, events? no, I never didn't remember. I always knew there was never... A, the only difference is how I characterized it. So when did that happen and how? Yeah, so in my mind, it was never... In my mind, I, would, I never perceived it as an abusive or wrong thing that happened uh, until... Well, actually, it's funny I say that. There, there's sort of like 
three phases to this. The first phase was when it was happening, and I felt mostly like, ooh, I'm in a secret club. It's kind of neat. So just a side note on this moment, was there any part of you that felt creeped out by Oh, it? yeah, totally. Uh, first of all, I actually didn't like doing any of the things. Mm. And in fact, there was, uh, what do you call it, trigger, warning, blah, blah. Uh, there was one time that I specifically remembered, and this was kind of like where I finally said no to something, because I think... Well, I don't think I've heard this. Yeah, I think she was on her period, and she wanted me to perform oral sex, which is normally what I would do, and there was blood, and I didn't want to, and I said, no, I didn't. And I remember that feeling of like, oh, the, what? I, don't, I don't even understand what's happening here. Because I didn't even know about periods or anything. So I'm like, why Why is there, is that blood? I don't, I don't understand. And even when it wasn't that, I never remember a single time where I was like, well, this is fun. It was always just like, hum, like in the secret club. That was it. That was the, the idea of like, I'm in a secret club. The, and the, I feel the, you're special. Trying to, yeah, and that was true. Right. And you're trying to focus on that in, yeah. the, in the moment yeah. while ignoring... Right. The actual, like, I don't want to be doing this, but I'm in a secret club. Cool. Yeah. So then that was all at the time. Then years go by, and it's not that I forgot it. I just didn't think about it. You know, I went to Columbia. I And that's typical because yeah. what guide do you have around no. thinking? Of, it's of easier not. to just yeah. not think about it. But, but, to be, but I want to be 100% clear. I didn't forget it. Yeah. I just wasn't... Focus on it. I wasn't uh, thinking about it. Uh, did you ever talk about it? Well, that goes to phase two. Phase two is I randomly, bizarrely run into her at a party in Colombia when I was 12. And she was now 18. And it, why is because one family, it, it's just a long connection. But anyways, the point I is... I thought she was, uh, so six? She was 12 when I was five. So whatever, seven plus 12. So maybe I was 11, she was 18. Uh, something like this. Okay. Some, uh, and I'm at this party... And I recognize her. And it's impossible not to recognize her because like, even though it's been many years, it's her. And I remember this was a new phase because even though I never certainly raised my hand to anyone and said, I was abused. I didn't even think of it in those terms. I knew something was secret and maybe not right. So I remember looking at her and trying not to break eye contact, and she avoided me. Meaning that you wanted to show that you're- That big, I knew. And you're a big boy now. I guess so, yeah. And uh, But I, I specifically remember the feeling in my head was like, I remember even hearing the words like, I know, I know. But I don't know what it is that, like I, I hadn't yet connected all the dots, right? It wasn't like, I know you abused me, and maybe you were abused, too. none of that, right? It was simply like, you can't hide from me. I know. Right. It, it, it's uh, not in a negative way. It's a power play. Yeah. Well, it makes sense. Logically, right. it's just like, you know that she did something horrible right. and preyed on a five-year-old boy. Right. And now with your 12-year-old mind, right. you know what she did. And, and, she, and you know, you would have... In any, you, you would imagine a, a different world, a pretty beautiful world, where the 12 year old babysitter who babysat this five year old years later at a party is like, now she's 18. So, like, oh my gosh, it's you. I can't believe how big you've gotten, right? Instead, there's complete avoidance. She, she clearly seemed not, you know, kind of thrown off by this situation, which of course now I understand fully why that would be because she's afraid in that moment. Like, oh God, what's, what's going to happen? So, in this moment, <laughs> it opened a can of worms, a good one, I suppose, that deserved to be opened about acknowledging in this very acute manner that she did something wrong to you. Yes, and it was, I left it at, it was more of like a wink, wink kind of thing. Like, ah, you know, we probably shouldn't have been doing that. You know, I know, mm. you know, I know. Well, was it possible that there were there was that duality like when you're a kid where there's yeah. a part of you that was really Certainly. soberly saying yeah but you i was yeah. fucked up yeah but i was you did something horrible to me but another part of happy go lucky birdo is just like oh well and happy go lucky 12 year old birdo which is still pre i mean i i don't even think i had had a 
an ejaculation yeah, maybe i had but like right. whatever i was certainly like not a full-on teenager with all my hormones and stuff i was just kind of getting there mm -hmm. so it wasn't even 17 year old dirty minded bear no it was like 12 year old bardo going uh-huh i know so that was phase two and then after that again didn't think about it years D go by didn't talk about it didn't talk about it didn't think about didn't it tell anybody didn't tell anybody and honestly i was never like I, it never came to my mind then years go by then what happens is phase three which is i'm in college and i'm pseudo bragging to my friend about this i'm like oh yeah dude i got i got together with a 12 year old when i was and I, and when i tell him this and he's like what that does he now remember that face of confusion with the hand down the pants that was him in that moment like oh that doesn't sound okay he felt he looked genuinely worried for me and i was like no nah, it was fine but that was like removing a jenga piece and that for the next decade was the beginning of an unraveling that was really scary and bad but i mean ultimately it turned out good but it was it was heading down full-on disaster and so right in the beginning if for example you're asked to talk about whatever you want to just free associate about that experience when you were five the next day after talking with your friend and or your friend reacted differently like Oh man, that, yeah, that boys will be boys, girls will be go, whatever. The, the next day, what would that free association sound like? Would it include similar to what anonymous listener is saying that I kind of frame it as just pure f sexual exploration? What, might you have said something along those lines? Well, I, I even more than that, I still felt quote lucky. I got lucky. You know, because there was that, you know, especially late teens, early 20s, there's this idea of like, you know, as a guy, you got to go out there and get lucky with the girls, you know, nail some females. Yes, I said it, you know. Well, that was still there. <laughs> that was still there. And so I think there was that part of my mind was like, yeah, dude, I mean, you want to talk about getting lucky? How about this one? That was how I was framing it was just this cool thing that happened to me. Even though I had had those feelings when I encountered it at 12 and stuff, it didn't really register. Mm -hmm. And until I saw a peer that I respected, in fact, what was most shocking to me is it's a peer who was just as or worse dirty minded as I am, whom we would have absolutely been like, dude, got to go to the bars, whatever, the whole thing, not reacting at all how I expected. Mm -hmm. That was the first time that I go, Whoa, what? Yeah. So... It, similarly, in a parallel manner to anonymous listener, that it's possible that she is at that point where you were at around yeah. the, uh, where the memory is there now, right? And uh, if she hasn't thought about it in a while, she doesn't really think about it, doesn't talk about it. And maybe if she had, she would have characterized it as exploration, just stuff that kids do. And she's at that point where she's mostly still thinking it's exploration, but there's this question mark. And to go over the hallmarks of your narrative that you're saying, and I'm a listener, and typically with clients that I work with, as they start to go down the road of exploration of this memory, there are discovered elements and components to the memories that become more in focus like for you Berto, when you first started remembering this in therapy or something you might have had a, a surface level memory of all the events as you start to think about it and talk about it i'm guessing you started to flesh it out more and say well yeah actually if i think about it i, I do now that i'm thinking about it i, I remember this other thing that happened and it it, it starts to expand on on the story right you know I, I it's what's weird about this particular thing is that i actually always seem to have had the vignettes mm -hmm. recorded almost as little mini trophies or something mm -hmm. so i didn't have a thing where like oh that's right this other thing it was more like hey which which of these trophies do you want me to show you mm -hmm. 
Like, let me tell you with all my vignettes. And it actually took some effort from my therapist. It, not just about this, but in general, to not to kind of change my modality from third person recounting of someone else's story mm. to actually feeling. And that, that took actually quite a bit of effort because mm -hmm. the memories were all there. It was more of like the feeling of it. Yeah. Interesting. Well, yeah. Well, I'm glad you met that therapist. And I suppose differently to the anonymous listener, uh, which is really common that afterwards you don't want to think about it. Yeah. It's hard to think about it. You don't know what to make of it. And it's just easier to forget and to repress. And the way that our memories work is that our memories become easier to recall if we recall them more often. Mm -hmm. So if we don't ever recall an event, the chance of remembering it is very little. Like, you know, <laughs> what I did even just like four weeks ago on a random Tuesday or something, I probably haven't thought about that day because nothing happened that was interesting enough for right. me to remember. And those- it'll be wiped from memory. Yeah, a, a year from now, it'll yeah. be completely wiped. But it's different though with these kinds of events because they're so strong and significant and emotionally right. impactful that it's hard to- actually dump them from your long-term memory well and and actually it's funny because you know you hear me saying how like it never came to mind during those other stretches of time but clearly it did and i just wasn't being consciously that aware of it because again they were burned burned into right. my memory right now earlier in your life you would have said they're burned in my memory because they were like really fun things or very special right. events but now after allowing yourself to feel the feelings that you feel naturally you see it as mostly negative yeah. exploited victimization with some positive aspects that you highlighted but uh, anonymous listener to use your words you were saying she would repeatedly take me up into a loft that's yeah. not uh, two kids participating in an event you also say yeah. she would tell me to take off my clothes and then make me perform sexual acts on, on her or with her. Oh, um, that That's uh, the way you're wording it. That's like, uh, I won't go into specifics, but I did have sexual exploration experiences yeah. as a kid with my friends and I would never word it this way. <laughs> no, no. Here's a, here's a one that literally happened to me and it, it was... I, I've never felt any bad things about it because it was like this. Uh, it's like I'm sitting there reading a book and I notice these two girls about our same age. We're all about the same age. They're in another room and they're, and I, and as I look down, look up from my book, I notice their pants are down and then they quickly put the, pull their pants up. I'm like, oh, and then I'm like, okay, it's, it's in the room across the hallway and both doors are open and they know I have a clear side of view, except I'm looking at my book, right? So, okay. So, it's clear so, that they're, they're trying to show you something. Not yet, but then at some point it becomes, hey, you should show us. Your, it's like a typical, like show us yours, yeah. you'll show you. And then I, after a lot of cajoling, because I, I was like, I'll do it if how, you guys. How old are you again? Like eight, okay. maybe. After a lot, because I was like, okay, well, show me what you got. And then maybe I'll show you what I got. So they did. They pulled down their pants and I was like, okay, I don't know, whatever. And then I kind of reneged on the deal for a little bit. And then after a long while, I was fine. And then I did pull my pants down. But that to me was like that kind of typical thing that happens at those ages. Which well, is even if it's typical, especially the way you're describing it, it could have absolutely been abusive to you. It sounds like... You, well, you, I picked up, I was in a different room. I stopped reading, stood up from my position, went over to the other room to sit down to keep reading there because <laughs> oh. I was certainly interested in what was happening. But then the element of yeah. them cajoling you to take your pants off. Well, because I did make a deal, right? I said, hey, if you guys do it, I'll do it. Yeah. And then I reneged. Man, listen, I'm not saying these things but, are but I just I'm yeah. not saying <laughs> that you were or that you should have been. I just want to clarify for others could have gone through the exact same sure, scenario sure. and it would have been but harmful. It, it, the, the reason to me I would categorize that differently is because uh, first of all, 
like we were all about the same and, and age like age doesn't matter in fact in this case example they were the same age but it wasn't like some adults pulling down their pants or something you know it was just like weird and well, it's also at the age where everyone is naturally curious well again yes those are all considerations and but, but the main fulcrum is harm and coercion oh, absolutely absolutely but it, yes and um even if, let's say, because, you know, someone maybe is more shy or more worried about their body or whatever, and they could have accidentally harmed me in that moment, mm -hmm. but they weren't trying to be abusives, uh, abusers. They weren't like, you know. But even, someone's even if someone isn't trying, they can still. Right. But there's a difference between like someone's like repeatedly taking you behind the yeah. couch into the other room, asking you to perform sexual acts on them, right. all those kinds of things versus a one-off thing where you like showed each other's genitals. But <laughs> this is the answer that I'll have to the main question of anonymous listener is what's the difference between peer and peer exploration sexually and sexual exploitation and abuse? It's coercion and harm. There are other words we can put that might be a little ancillary to that, but that's the core. Did someone, was someone harmed by that and was yeah. coercion a part? Did someone feel pressured to do those things. You can even have a situation where the coercion isn't actually even happening from the from the other person. The coercion could be from society. Like you can have a s scenario where like it's a, an arranged marriage or something and you're 25 and the two of you are expected by culture to have sex that night and your partner is also kind of nervous or let's even extend it to you and your partner both don't want to have sex that night but you have to in order to consummate or follow the cultural code you'll be uh, humiliated or i don't know judged for the rest of your life or who knows and you both participate in sex with each other against your will there's a chance that both of you will be experiencing harm from that coercion so it, it's, it's the coercive nature, the, the nature of not having a choice. Like when you, Birdo, were with the babysitter, if you had the power and you were given the choice, I'm guessing you would have said, look, with an adult mind, I suppose, you would say, look, I love that you are making me feel special and I want that. I don't want to perform sexual acts on you. Right, right, right. Uh, uh, but I would love to have like... Be friends and let's color together. Or have our own special fort right. where we have our yeah. special Keyboard, language. Secret words, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or we uh, talk about things that other people... Or whatever. I, I don't want to be used as a piece of meat in your right. meeting your own needs or whatever. I also want to add though that th to me there's also an element of sort of like recurrence and severity because... Imagine that a group of friends about that age or whatever uh, decide to go skinny dipping in the lake and then one person doesn't want to go and everyone kind of cajoles them, pressures them. And then they're somewhat traumatized from that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally. Still, different level of degree where every Friday night for hours they are abused in a, in a secret room by someone. Like f for years, right? Like I, I'm saying like th there are degrees to these things. And so this one not only has the signs that you're mentioning, which is like, you know, coercion and things like that, but it sounded like it happened repeatedly. And the level of it's, we're not talking about pull your pants down. It's also perform acts on me. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not minimizing. People can be traumatized by even the simplest things. Uh, like it, it, in my case, I, I probably would have still had some trauma if one time this person had said, hey, pull your pants down. That would have been, but certainly <laughs> the infliction was repeated and constant in different rooms. And the, like, it's just, uh, and the acts involved, it's just like. <laughs> yeah, other, other elements to your email is shame. Now, that's not a slam dunk indication of victimization, but it's definitely a red flag for that. Also, the secrecy. You said in your email, she told me not to tell. Now, again, if you had exploration right. and one person was like, look, you can't tell anybody because my parents will you know, kill me. Uh, that's one thing. But when you put everything together, um, also, according to your narrative, 
you were someone that was having trouble finding friends. And I'm assuming she was not one of those people. And so there's a chance that she even identified you as an easy victim, yep. as someone at the very least to control and have under her thumb. And at worst, she knew from the beginning that she was going to do something like this to you, not because she's an evil human being per se, but because she, in all likelihood she had been harmed in this way yeah. and was acting out on it. Oh, and by the way, like to give, to give an example of what you were mentioning. So, you know, I mentioned the scenario where it's like, you know, we were playing, show me yours, I'll show you mine. But I actually had a different experience where I, I did feel it's almost the same scenario, but I did feel like that was not cool. Yeah. And it was, I, once again, in New York, New York was a very unsafe place, it seems like. Um, this little boy was two years older than me. So I was five, they were seven. And they lived in the same building where I was babysat by this person. So it's possible that person was also abusing them. I'm not sure. But here's what happened. Sometimes I would go to that apartment, which by the way, apparently my dad didn't know because like what it would be is like I was supposed to be being watched by the other people, but they'd have to go do something. So they'd just send me upstairs to the other thing. And so I was there. And this little boy, clearly in retrospect, there must have been some bad stuff happening because number one, he would always talk about like all these, he, he, he told me he had this secret room at his school where he would have sex with girls. This is a seven-year-old boy. So there's something not right or right. Yeah. And then one time, and this is what, what I'm alluding to, one time he basically cajoled me to showing him my penis. And I think he showed me his, I can't remember. I didn't feel good at all about that. Hmm. Nothing. There's no touching, nothing happened, but it was pressure. And he was two years older, so there was like, you know, it wasn't, he wasn't a big kid, but it was like, you know, at yeah. that age, two years is a big deal. Wow. And I felt pressured. Yeah. You know? uh, you've never told me this. Just the fact that he was exposing you to ideas of sex. Yeah. Let alone that and, he coerced you, forced you. Right. And I had to lie because I felt, I was like, yeah, I have, I have a secret room in my school too. Like, you know, I was like making all this stuff up because he was telling me these things. Yeah. That was an unsafe abusive relationship <laughs> yeah yeah that's not exploration <laughs> that's not exploration yeah um i want to say also that i did experience one event that people might have framed as exploration mutual exploration i did experience it as coercive and very uncomfortable there was a, a girl i think i was in my head we were like four we're the same age, and she said, uh, you know, I'll show you mine if you show you yours, and I didn't, I, I don't think I had done things like that along those lines, and and by the way, I, I know her now, I've known her my whole life, <laughs> like we've right, right. grown up together, and she's you know, a f good friend of mine, not a good friend now, but um, she's a good person, right, right. <laughs> so I, I don't know what's going on with her, right, right. but she wanted to do that and i was uh, basically like um okay like you felt pressured into yeah and so she uh, uh stripped completely naked and then says okay your turn oh boy and i'm like uh uh and i you know there's nothing about this that is appealing to no. me or <laughs> something i want to do and I remember that I unzipped my pants, mm -hmm. which was kind of a big deal to begin yeah. with. Like, it was, Your flies open was a big deal. Right. I unzipped my pants and I just kind of laid on my side. Oh my God. Like, I hope that this is enough. Oh, poor little Kirk. <laughs> no. Yeah. And that memory is burnt in yeah. my brain because oh it, uh, and, and she, I think she was really trying to, you know, get me to, undress and it didn't work uh, i just held my ground so to speak yeah. or uh and then that was it and it never happened again anything with her but the other explorations that i had with my friends my really close friends actually were um you know pretty numerous actually mm -hmm. <laughs> i mean not in the dozens but like i don't know maybe five to ten things that i can remember to this right, day right. 
and they were, from my memory, mutually agreed upon and pretty low stakes. Yep. Um, but if we were happened upon, it would have looked pretty, yeah, it would have looked pretty weird. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of it was exploration of our bodies yep. and self-discovery in a way that we were not given that opportunity in any other circumstance. <laughs> it was facilitated partially by the fact that in the 70s, we were always outside whenever we could be because there wasn't anything to do inside. And there were all these woods and trees. And so we would go into the woods and wander for miles. And uh, <laughs> uh, our parents, we could be 10 feet into the quote unquote woods. And it was like this invisible shield that adults couldn't penetrate oh. because they just, they yes. didn't want to get their shoes dirty yeah. <laughs> or they didn't want to get caught up in a spider web or they didn't know the trails. And so they would just yell at us from, <laughs> from... From I can't come in, but you guys need to come back. <laughs> yeah. And, and so once we crossed that threshold, you're in another world. And so we would do a lot of things. And, and, and one of the things that we would do is we wouldn't bother going home to pee. So we would just <laughs> pee everywhere. Yeah. We had designated spots sure, that sure. we would pee. Uh, but there were many of them in the woods. And we would pee together. And so there was a lot of opportunity to, uh, I don't know, just passively understand that we all had <laughs> genitalia, gen genitalia right. you know, and, and the girls would too, you know, right. uh, there were a lot of girls in the neighborhood. Anyway, so there was just that natural exploration. Um, but I will say that there was one event that happened that I, in my mind, it was the last time we, as a friend group in my neighborhood, ever mm -hmm. did anything along these lines. And it was two of my friends, and I won't go into graphic detail, and I think it was mutually exploration. Mm -hmm. But the things that those two were doing, because we were a little older, I don't mm -hmm. know how old we would have been, maybe like fifth grade or something. The things that those two people were doing were definitely in the direction of having sex, uh, but not having sex. Right. And they wanted all of us to be doing it, like all of us friends right. in the in the woods. And none of us wanted right. to do it. Normally, we would all be doing the same sure, thing. Sure, sure. But this time... That was a, a, uh, a line you, would, you guys me didn't and cross. the other friends were just kind of looking at each other like, uh, we don't want to do this, right? This isn't... I mean, that's <laughs> good for them, but uh, <laughs> let's go like ride our our, our bikes <laughs> around the, the trees or something. Um, oh, my gosh. Um, and in my head, that drew this line right that we just never went there again because it was like oh this is this feels different you know but i don't know i mean it's possible that those two maybe one of them wasn't really wanting to do it i don't know yeah yeah i know those people i guess i could ask yeah. them. but anyway so uh, advice to you an anonymous listener that i have is to continue to explore this in therapy it's totally normal to have these memories emerge later on it's also normal to not consider this sexual abuse, even though it, it, it might have been, mm -hmm. because in our society, we don't think of two girls who are the same age as having that element, you know? Right. But from your narrative and from the description, you know, it's a good chance that, that it was harmful. And it would explain a lot. I, I don't think... Uh, you didn't say this explicitly, but it sounds like you have a lot of classic signs of having been sexually abused. You talk about hypersexuality, the anxiety, eating disorders, that kind of thing. And many therapists have, as you've been working with them, have said, there's a chance you've been sexually abused. So I'm, I'm guessing by context, you don't have another sexual abusive history story element in your history um, to say, well, yeah, there was that one thing. So, you know, it's possible that this was that. And if it happened repeatedly, that can really do a number on you. You know, you're Jeez. just think about it. you're six years old, yeah. you know, you have trouble making friends, this popular kid or a kid that is cool, that you would just love to have a, you know, you, you, you see other people with friends, you know, when you're six, 
friends are everything, right? Yeah. Uh, the, to have a friend or to have two friends or to not have friends. Right. I mean, it is, it is rough. And to finally have that happen and then you're just so giddy and so happy, like finally I'm normal. And then you're just being used yeah. for your, uh, you know, as a, I keep saying this, but like a sack of meat, you know, yeah. that that's the lesson that y you walk away with. And like Berto, you could have been experiencing it as a, a very negative thing, but just trying to go along with it because there was so much at stake and you didn't know better. And all, meanwhile, there's all these lessons that are being learned and all these harms that are happening. And, um, you know, it's possible that uh, a lot of that comes through that. Yeah. I'm also guessing that uh, uh, your avoidant attachment style in all likelihood doesn't come from that. It could, uh, at least in part, but I'm guessing that your early childhood didn't have uh, enough attunement from your parents or some other kind of harm that happened in addition to this. But, but you know, it's possible. But, I, you know, there's no way to know until you explore that. All right, let's take a break. When we get back, one more email. What do you say? Let's do it. All right, Berto, back from the break. So this is a email from an honest middle tier patron. She says, what do you think about the whole telling someone you cheated only benefits you thing? You know, where yeah, right. they'll say, you know, if, if you tell someone you cheated on them, it only benefits you. Anytime I have heard the disclosure is selfish argument in person, it has come across as self-interested rather than genuinely altruistic. Uh, Berto, can you summarize what she's saying here? Well, yeah. I mean, I also can definitely relate to a lot of this because... No, um, summar summarize it because yeah. in case people aren't following what I'm saying. Okay. So basically, uh, your, your situation is someone cheats and they then disclose that they cheated. But the, the common thing is to say, well, that only benefits you, the cheater, because you got a load off your mind, but it doesn't help the person that was cheated on. Yeah. So yeah. therefore, you should never exactly. tell your yeah. partner that you cheated on them right. because that's the altruistic thing. And yeah. anonymous middle tier patron is saying, that sounds a little self-interested. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, so there, I look at it from two sides. One, it definitely can be used that way. And I have done, I've been guilty of that throughout, not throughout, but at times in my life, uh, where essentially I used to have this philosophy where the main thing is, uh, I was like, I'm going to be honest. So no matter what I do, I'm just always going to be honest about what it is that I've done now. And I do stand by that. I do think that ultimately hiding secrets and, you know, having like mysteries that you hide from the people you love is actually not good. I, I think it's bad. <laughs> so I stand by that. That said, I, it, here's the, the trick. So let's use a different example. Let's say I'm like, oh my gosh, Kirk. So the last time I was here, I, I got to confess, I, I took one of your books without asking. So I, I, sh I shouldn't have done that. But anyways, here, here's the book. I'm like, okay. Next time I see you, hey, Kirk, just so you know, last time I was here, I once again took a book and I just keep doing this. But I'm telling you every time, well, wait a minute. Maybe the first time that was noble, but like, come on. So I think that there's there's a sense in which you can abuse the system by basically letting yourself off the hook. Like as long as I just confess every time, then I could just keep doing whatever the hell. That's bad. But the the flip side is also bad. The flip side of like, hey, listen, you know what? I know I'm having this affair, but it would hurt them more if I like tell them. So I'm not going to tell them. I'm just going to keep in the dark. And even that one has multiple facets. Let's say you had a one-time thing, right? And it really didn't mean anything. You're not continuing a relationship. And then it's years and years. And then at some point you're like, I just got, I got to tell them. I got to tell them. Maybe that's not the right answer at that point. Maybe at that point you might want to let, because maybe your relationship is actually really strong and this will just cause this unnecessary trauma. It's hard to say. But what is definitely not right is like, you know what? I'm just going to keep the relationship going in secret. And I'm not just, I'm just not going to tell them and just lie constantly because that would hurt them. That's the nice thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, going on with the email. How often do you think choosing not to disclose infidelity is going to benefit the other person? So how often or what factors 
Like yeah. if you just, you know, you're, you're cheating and what factors would push you over the edge to not tell your partner? Well, so here's a very, I don't know, simple example. Um, years ago, I used to go to Vancouver with a lot more frequency. And actually, uh, like this is maybe like late 90s, early 2000s, you know. And uh, while I was in Vancouver one time, I experienced for the first time ever in my life what they colloquially refer to as a happy ending massage, you know. Uh, well, when I got back to civilization, I felt compelled to confess my sins. Just side note. It's funny that you consider Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada to be outside of civilization. <laughs> yes. But it, it, is it is treated that way by... by it is people in Seattle and Tacoma, yes. it's like our version of like Vegas or something. It's like yeah. crossing the border into this other land and all the debauchery and stuff. But I'm sure Canadians come into Seattle right. and do the same thing. But there is a difference in that the drinking age in Van in British it Columbia, it's lower, yeah. uh, I don't know if it, it still is, but back then it was 19. It was right? 19. Yeah, yeah. So it was a very yeah. different thing. So I, I felt the compelling need to confess right away. Yeah. And <laughs> looking back on it, that and, that, and to be clear, that would be considered infidelity by your partner at the time, for sure. Yeah, because we were young, and you know, it, you know whatever. And, and many people are like, I. If someone wants to consider that infidelity, be be my guest, right? Like, if that's the arrangement you have or don't have, that's totally correct, right, or incorrect, whatever you want to do. But at the time, certainly we did not have an arrangement where I'm like, yeah, I can go get happy ending myself, right? Like, that was not a thing. At the same time, now with the benefit of hindsight, uh, that was an unnecessary move on my part because the thing is, this wasn't like something, it, it did cause hurt and consternation, but at the same time, this wasn't like a thing that was like an ongoing situation or anything like that. Mm. And so it is one of those gray zones, right? So you're saying it might have been more altruistic to not tell her. Yeah, and so now the way I viewed it and I would almost stand by it, was like, I'd rather my partner have all the da data and all the facts and then be able to make decisions based on that. It's just that as I've grown older, I'm like, ah, I don't know. Do I need to know every single thing at all times about every little yeah. interaction? I don't know. Right, you know? because it, 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 so a lot, there's so many factors that you have to take into consideration because if you have a partner that... Although on policy doesn't want you doing stuff like that, but is less reactive to that kind of information, they might get hurt, concerned right. about STI or whatever. But it's it's not going to damage them and floor them and plague them. Right. Uh, then telling them has it's less of a risk. You you never know how it's going to affect the other person. Right. But whereas you have a partner that could just be destroyed right. by that, then that is a factor. Another factor is, are you going to do it again? Are you right. taking measures <laughs> not to do it again? Right, because like the, the, the thing that I will still agree on is like, well, wait a minute, rewind. You're, you're already three steps down the road. Like, did you tell her? Like, right. the question was, did you have an agreement where that was cool? <laughs> right, exactly. So the uh, uh, here, here's my answer is that, uh, you're asking, uh, is it uh, when when should you tell your partner that you cheated on them, and when should you not? Because clearly, uh, there's a debate, and there's some self servingness to saying, "Well, I'm doing the nice thing by not telling them," but sometimes you know it might actually be the altruistic thing. So it really it really depends, and there is no rule to this. I've been down this road many times with friends and with clients and there is no way to know you have to take case by case yeah but uh, getting to what Berto is saying is that being three steps down the road already is that ideally you would not have cheated in the first place right <laughs> but if you are you have to choose between the lesser of two pretty big evils right number one is you're cheating and harming your partner in secret and you hope that they never find out, which might save them from additional harm because they're already being harmed right. by the infidelity. But 
if you withhold the information, then you might save them from additional harm by knowing about it. And this all uh, assumes that you're doing something to not do it again, <laughs> going to therapy, uh, you know, taking measures, cutting off relationships, telling the person you can't see them anymore, or whatever. Um, and, but, and, and sorry to interject there. That was, that was to me the biggest problem that I had when I was younger is that my policy was truth always, but it, it wasn't accompanied by let's go to therapy. Right, let's go try to fix other problems. <laughs> like what a military patron is saying, it's self-serving yeah. because to you, you're like, well, I'm being honest right. and <laughs> she could leave me if she wants to. But if <laughs> yeah. looking back, you, you know that given her issues, she wouldn't necessarily have the agency or the, the foundation to really look after herself, you know, and make, well, and, and, it, and let's be, I'll be honest with myself. It's a BS argument. Cause if she had decided to leave me, I would have been devastated. Yeah. I wouldn't have been so blase. Well, good. I mean, that's how I wanted it. Right. I, It'd be one thing if, <laughs> if the two of you were like, you know, equally ambivalent about the relationship, right. you know, it was in the beginning or it was on the rocks and you're just like, Hey, FYI. Yeah. I just, I got to tell you. And if, you know, push comes to shove and she leaves me, then I guess that's the straw that, but, but that was not where you're at. No, where, where I would have been like, why? You're uh, me. Yeah. Um, so if you don't tell them, you might save them from additional harm from them finding out, but you are risking massively harming them, potentially traumatizing your partner if you are found out suddenly. And in those situations, not only is your partner being harmed and they're going to lose trust in you because of the infidelity, but they're also going to lose even potentially exponentially more trust in you because right. you've been hiding it from them the whole time. Right, right, right. Um, I, I had a, a client who actually suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder months after discovering that her husband had been cheating on her. Mm. The, uh, uh, it's not always the case, but you know, she came across some texts and it was right there in black and white, you know, she's scrolling through it and her body ha had this fear reaction and, and she hadn't been sexually abused or anything in the past, as far as I knew, but it made total sense to me as she's describing it because your life is being turned on its head hmm. and you are now realizing, wait, so he's been lying to me this whole time. Does he love me? Does anyone love me? Am I safe in this world? Is he looking after me? Oh, uh, what man. What else is he doing? You know, like it, it's natural to have it blossom like that. And that is a terrifying. Yeah. Okay. So then your other evil choice, I mean, your lesser of several evils is again, you're harming your partner in secret by cheating. And then at some point you reveal the cheating to your partner, which will cause them uh, profound hurt and demoralization. Right. And their trust will be destroyed, uh, uh, you know, say 50% or 20% if you didn't tell them and they discovered it. Because it, it, you know, I'm assuming this is not a scenario where you had this very weird one night stand. And then at the first chance, like you just finish right. and you text, because for every second that ticks by, and typically this would be weeks, months, right, right, right. Um, is lying by omission totally um but anyway uh, let's say you do it you know soon after uh the the damage is there yeah and telling them will destroy their trust in you and and really hurt them but you're not risking them finding out and being traumatized in a in a to a greater degree so either option is horrible and you can uh, avoid that conundrum by not cheating in the first place, and you can avoid that conundrum by understanding your needs yeah. and uh, proactively addressing them and planning your life out in a differentiated manner so that you can get your needs met right. uh, with the best path forward. Unfortunately, because of the way we structure our society and our learning process, many of us don't learn any of this stuff until it's well <laughs> too late. Mm -hmm. And we're like in our late 30s sometimes. Yeah. Now, I'll, in conclusion, I'll say 
it is possible for me, and I've been here before, where I have gone along with someone's decision to not tell their partner because they had evaluated thoroughly and comprehensively that that was the lesser of two evils. But if someone said, well, you, you don't tell your partner because that'll hurt them and, and just flippantly says that and, and that just, you know, job done, I'm, I'm in the clear, then that is a problem. And I would potentially yeah. not want to be friends with someone like that because <laughs> it means that they might, it, it, it sets a precedent that what if I'm looking at my shelf and five of my books are gone, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Now, look, when, when I look back, I still think it was ultimately better in my situation because I hadn't sought therapy yet because I hadn't gone through the years of idiocy that I needed to go through. It was better ultimately that I was at least, at least always just honest. <laughs> you know, just it, it, you were mentioning lessers of two evils. In my case, I look back and I'm like, well, uh, yes, I was, my mind was such a mess. And, yeah. but at least I wasn't also tripling down by living in lies day in and day yeah. out. And the way that I see it is the arc of history bends towards justice that this was a necessary step towards health right and treating people well in your romantic life and given where you were at we wouldn't expect that you would leapfrog several steps you know this because right because what would have been nice is okay let's say i mess up and then i actually take three steps at the same time one is i'm not actually going to bring this up but I'm going to therapy. I'm going to never do it. Like, I'm going to correct my life, you know? Yeah. And maybe. Okay. But that's not what we were talking about, right? Again, it was the... <laughs> and, and to be clear, the correction wasn't like, I need to be a better person. It was, I need to get in touch with my trauma. Totally. And my emotions. Exactly. And I need, I need to... Exactly. I need to be given the attunement from someone, a therapist, who actually pays attention to me and, and allows me to slow down. I, I, absolutely, because that's so important that you said that, because actually, it, at the time, if you had asked me like, hey, is there anything wrong with your decisions? I'd be like, oh yeah, totally. The surface level is right. the wrong thing. Yeah, and I see this all <laughs> the time. When I watch reality TV, there will be people that will be caught cheating or some other thing like this, and they will often have these very brief answers. They seem to be remorseful, right. kind of. Yeah, I shouldn't have gone to that strip club, dude. You're right. Like, or they'll, they'll, <laughs> okay, quote, they'll quote, unquote, take responsibility. <laughs> right, right, right. They'll say, yeah, that was totally wrong. I screwed up. I, yeah. I should never have done. I mean, that's better than just being right. worse than that. But you'll hear that, and it'll sound like, oh, well, obviously, it'll never happen again. But when I hear those things, and that's right. all I hear... I'm I'm hearing you then, yeah. which absolutely yeah. means whatever personality problem led to that is still there. Still there and yeah. of course, the yeah. the uh, cheater doesn't know that that thing exists, <laughs> right? And so the cheating or something along those lines is going to happen again, and they will probably again identify that it was wrong, and. Uh, I mean, at least that's the hope and they'll feel remorseful right. and they'll apologize and they'll say they'll never do it again. And they might even beg to have their partner come back. And from the outside, it'll be framed by the internet as it's a narcissist. Right. It's a psychopath because it, in a crude way, it looks like that. Cause right. how could you continue to do those things and apologize and acknowledge it? Right, right, right. <laughs> uh, uh, how do those things coincide? They can't, it must be a trick, Right. And it can be, but more often than not, like the vast majority of the time, honestly, it's because of something along those lines. And for you, it was a denial of your emotions, of the you on the inside, yeah. of your needs, an unawareness of what was happening, a desperation for distractions from the pain, you know, that had never been acknowledged. So not even related to sexuality, for example, I used to do these things where every now and then intermittently I'd go out on a social night and I would get way, way, way too drunk. And I would go out and wander the city in the middle of the night by myself, super dangerous behavior. Like I'd be by myself, totally intoxicated. Did you ever punch a guy at a, at a seven 11? 
I didn't. <laughs> I see where you're getting with. No, but I did yell in people's faces. I started talking to drug dealers. I pretended to be an undercover cop. I don't know how I didn't end up dead, honestly. But if you had asked me, Berto, don't you see that the you know next day I'm sobered up? Don't you think this is? I'm like, oh, dude, yeah, no, no, oh, I I can't drink that much, man. I. The problem would have been, oh, I drank too much. Or like, I, I, well, if I drink that much, I shouldn't go wandering off by myself like that. There wasn't an awareness of right. why. Why did I even drink that much? A. B, when I did drink that much, what came out? What is that? Because there's no modeling for this. No, exactly. There's no awareness of this, particularly around men, by right. the way. And when you're that young, none of your friends, or very few anyway, are going to therapy and no. thinking about these things. So you're just lost doop, 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 doop. yeah well, what option do you have other yeah. than to say yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah dude no, that, I, that was wrong i need to I never need do to, that again i need to cut back and i yeah. need to um not cheat i need to stay away from yeah. those places I, i'll just never do it again i'll, I'll, I'll and next it applies time, to everything next time I i'll say no that kind of stuff it applies to everything i shouldn't spend that much money like that i shouldn't i shouldn't i shouldn't right yeah it's all the things that we are aware of like we shouldn't do that but when you're not aware of why yeah the underlying and to put a fine point on it, if I had managed, if we, or the two of us, you and me, take a time machine, go back to you at the age of 27, yep. and we quarantine you in a, in a room <laughs> for like a month, and we debate, and we show you graphs, and <laughs> you tell yourself, I, I know, because I was yeah. there, and we can, and we show the path and we connect that Birdo with his emotions and his needs and right. the trauma and the past and everything and say, you could still have fun. You know, it's not saying you can't have fun or you can't drink or you can't right. have with friends or you can't have sexual things, but you know, there's this extra stuff that's happening and destroying your life. Yeah. And here's why, and here's, here's the path forward. Um, I'm convinced that you would be convinced by that. Yeah. And so <laughs> we have right now, how many people, especially around the world, who are in those shoes, yeah. and uh, they would need that level of quarantining <laughs> totally. and convincing totally. uh, from a compassionate person who gets it and is not like, you lack a, a character yeah. or you're a narcissist. You know, When I think about this, it brings me so much sadness <laughs> that we live in a world that just doesn't have that ability to help people in these scenarios. And then of course, a lot of these people end up having kids and then the cycle continues. Yeah. And if we could just have that thing, it might not even take a month, you know, it might just take like three hours or something. Uh, if, if we could just reach those people and, and help them, mm. they, it would really set things right. You know, think yeah. of all the things that you could have accelerated totally. Uh, yeah, if, or, or even if we go back further, like when you're 23 or something, yeah. you, know, um, you could have still had all the fun and all the good things without the bad things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, that does it for that episode. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it.